Well, what I'd like to focus on tonight is a teaching related to what I call taking heart. And you can certainly apply it to events in the world right now. Uh, you know, Vladimir Putin's uh, attack, his invasion and war on the people of, of Ukraine. You can certainly also apply this teaching of taking heart to anything you like, um, to difficulties in your personal life, struggles with other people, concerns about events for other people around the world, or as concern for injustice in your own in your own country. Um, so I'm going to stay away from you know saying much about particular situations and keep trying to focus on broad principles of practice, including taking heart. Uh, this teaching is something I've written about in the book that I just finished, which will come out probably in a year roughly from now, about relationships. And so, you know, you'll see my eyes reading a little bit here, uh, and I hope that's not bothersome for you. Okay. And then after I finish, we'll open it up for discussion. Take heart. By taking heart, I mean several related things. Sensing your heart and chest. Second, finding encouragement and support from others around you. Third, finding the good inside yourself, appreciating what is good inside yourself and taking heart from it. And then fourth, being courageous, being wholehearted, walking your talk, um, really stepping forward into the world with a strong heart. That's what I mean by taking heart. When you take heart, you're more able to deal with everyday challenges, and you're also more able to deal with big things, big crises, big emergencies, maybe coming right at you or maybe coming at other people in the world that you have care and concern for. It takes heart to live in even ordinary times. In particular, it takes heart to live in, to live with, and to live beyond really hard times. Your personal hard time might be bad news about your health, the loss of a loved one, or betrayal by another person. That could be your personal hard time. Or the hard times could be related to changes in your country or changes in the world and concerns about their effects on others as well as eventually on yourself. There are so many examples, aren't there, of honorable people, certainly the, such as in the magnificent example these days of the brave people of the Ukraine. There are many examples around the world, so many examples of honorable people facing great difficulty with dignity, principle, and courage. And if they can do it, we can do it too. So, how to do it, how to take heart. Start by riding out the storm. This is really important. Slow it down, especially in the beginning. When big things happen at any scale, could be in your child's uh, schoolyard, or it could be a, in a refugee camp on the other side of the world. When, thing, when big things happen, it is completely natural and normal to be shocked or disturbed by them. Of course, we're shocked. Of course, we're disturbed by them. As best you can, stay with the raw experience the body sensations, the deep feelings, the stirred up fears and anger. Whatever it is, it is your experience, and it's okay if you're more affected or less affected than some other people. Be mindful of whatever is passing through the big space of awareness, the sky of mind, observing it without being flooded by it. This is the foundation, this capacity to be present with what we're feeling, especially its primary qualities, not so much our big story about it, letting go of that, but staying with the sensations, the emotions, the wants, 
the, you know, the, the totality of your own experience, staying with that. And as you stay with it, then gradually you can move into releasing it and eventually even replacing it gradually and authentically with thoughts and feelings that are helpful, wholesome, wise, and even happy in some deep, in some deep way. When the bottom falls out, do simple things that help you come back to center and find your footing. For example, call a friend, make your bed. That's what I do when I get depressed. Take good care of your body by making a good meal for yourself and trying to get enough sleep. Take some deep breaths and perhaps meditate a bit. All these things help when the bottom falls out close to home or on the other side of the world. These are the fundamentals. This is our foundation. When it's true, when it is true, notice that you're basically all right in the present. You're basically all right right now, most of the time. You may not be happy. Your body may be in pain. There may be worry or anger in your mind. And still, in the present, now, your body is continuing to breathe. Your heart is continuing to beat. You're going on living. You're still aware. Your mind is still working. You're basically all right, right now in the core of your being. When that is true, it's really useful to notice it and to rest in the feeling of that, which is a powerful antidote to anxiety and helplessness. If you can too, find a little pleasure somewhere. Look at something beautiful, smell something good, take comfort in soft cloth against your skin. These are not indulgences. This is first aid. This is psychological first aid. Pleasure, simple, wholesome, basic pleasure is psychological first aid when we're really upset about something. It's okay. It's okay to enjoy the smell of an orange or the feeling of warm water on your face. Look at the trees. Look at the sky. Get a cup of tea and stare into space. All this helps when the bottom falls out. All this helps you take heart. It's also important to guard and guide your attention. It's one thing to find facts and form the best plans you can. I'm definitely, you know, staying informed and, you know, making plans as best I can. And a little bit of that can go a long way. It's another thing entirely to get distracted or upset by news or other people that do not add any useful value. You decide where you're gonna draw that line and different people will draw that line in different ways. But I think it's important to be careful to guard and guide your attention and to help it not get hijacked and sucked in to things that you're helpless about and you already understand and you know can't do anything about. There's, there's no value there. Meanwhile, take heart in what's good, not to ignore what's bad, to actually strengthen yourself, to deal with what's bad. Take heart in so much that is good. Outside you, right now, there is the kindness in others. There is the beauty of a single leaf, the stars that still shine no matter what hides them. Right now, as, as you hear me, right now, all over the world, children are laughing in delight. Families are sitting down to a meal. Babies are being born and loving arms are holding people who are dying. Inside you, right now, there is your compassion, your sincere efforts, sweet memories, your capabilities, and much more. These things are true. They do not change what is horrible or painful or unjust. And by recognizing these good things that are true, we can find comfort and strength in them for its own sake. And also for the ways in which finding that comfort and strength 
enable us to take care of more of what's bad. It's important to take heart with others, camaraderie, fellow feeling. We can share worries, we can support each other, we can come together powerfully. Millions and millions of people focused together on growing the good in this world. We can take heart with other people. Do what you can. Do the things you can. Planning, action, binds anxiety. Uh, The more that events are turbulent, alarming, and beyond your influence, the more important it is to grow stability, safety, and agency inside you and around you. Make a little list of things you'll actually do. Focus where you do have power, you do have influence, especially if bad, you know, things have happened that you're powerless over. Focus where you do have power. Can you choose to drink a little water? Can you choose to turn on a light? You know, can you choose the color of the shirt you're going to wear? Uh, Making little choices and being aware of the feeling that you are a chooser, you are active, you are, you know, a hammer instead of a nail, uh, that is a really useful thing to do. Have courage. The longer I'm a therapist and the longer that, you know, I practice in the Buddhist tradition and engage a process, hopefully, of awakening, interestingly, the more important courage becomes. Courage, whose root meaning from the French is heart, the strong heart. So many people have courage, not just the mighty warriors, as courageous as they are, But everyday people, everyday people have courage. So find courage and know the feeling of courage. It doesn't mean being aggressive. It doesn't mean taking foolish risks. But have a feeling of being strong in your heart for the good. That's what I mean by courage. Strong in your heart for the good, including in the face of resistance. At all human scales, from a family with a tyrant for a father, all the way up through the many, many people who've lived under the thumb of a tyrant over the last 10,000 years. At all human scales, strong forces have tried to confuse and frighten others. Whatever outward action is necessary, and you may be limited in what you can do outwardly, inside yourself, You can always preserve an inner freedom in what you see and what you value and what you know is true. Never cowed or bowed in the core of your being. Last, personally, I have found that it really helps to have perspective. Without minimizing one bit of whatever is awful anywhere, at any time. It is also true that humans like you and I have been walking this earth for 300,000 years. I see the trees, the land, the ocean, all of it before me and lasting long after me. Empires rise and fall. Sometimes the center does not hold in a body a marriage, or a nation, and still. And still, people love each other, go out of their way for a stranger, and marvel at a rainbow. And still, nothing, nothing at all can change this. We keep footing, we keep putting one foot in front of the other, step by step, lifting each other up along the way. That's how we can take heart.
And I really want to personally thank you for being with me personally here, as well as obviously being with other people. You give me heart. That's what I'm feeling right now. I can feel the ways in which you support me in the difficult work <laughs> of being strong for the good, the difficult work of courage. I want to thank you. You give me heart. And I know that we give each other heart as well. So I got a question from someone. Uh, I won't use your name if you send it to me directly, but I will share what, what you wrote. Really an interesting, important, foundational question. How does one stay with it, stay with your raw feelings, yet view these thoughts neutrally? So I want to make sure I understand that. Um, when feelings or physical pain are really intense and shocking, it is natural in the moment to be carried away by them. Over time, we really can develop an underlying continuity of witnessing, of awareness that is, is not entirely swept away, even by the worst things of all. But that typically takes some training and practice to just rest in that. So it's okay if for the first few seconds or minutes, even hours, we are just carried along. Okay. But at a certain point, we are able to step back. That stepping back is the most important move of all because it's the foundation of all other practice. We step back from our experiences and instead of being carried away by, by it, we are witnessing it. We are being with it. We are observing it. In this witnessing, we really feel it. To be able to feel what is extremely difficult it helps to resource yourself by training in mindfulness, by developing self-compassion, by becoming more resilient inside, by gradually um, lifting your general mood through taking in the good again and again to build up an underlying core of resilient well-being. These are things that help us stabilize in our witnessing so we're not swept away. That's how to do it. And with practice, you know, it becomes more natural to you. You become more, con more stable in it, even when things are really, really challenging. Now, you use the word neutral. I'm not exactly sure what's meant by that, but what I, what I would say is that um, we can accept what is happening while also having reactions to it. It is normal to not like pain. It is normal to like pleasure. Those reactions are not neutral. That's okay. I am not neutral about Vladimir Putin invading the Ukraine. I am not neutral about racism around the world and here at home in America. I'm not neutral about feeding children. It's okay to not be neutral about those things. Um, we can, in other words, both be accepting and recognize the impermanence and the impersonal nature of the streaming of consciousness and the unfolding of reality altogether, we can recognize the vastness of all that, we can be accepting about it, while also having wise intentions and stands in relationship to it. It's, it's really all okay. And that uh, space, that intersection, that combination where you don't take it personally, how life is unfolding. You, you recognize the vastness of it, the sweep of it, the emptiness of any single experience. We can live in that with that kind of equanimity, also with a very warm and courageous heart. And the combination of those two is a life's work. We tend to swing back and forth. Uh, you know, in myself, I probably developed equanimity to a pretty 
good level and I, my, my warm heartedness needed to catch up. And now more and more, I'm trying to help love lead the way. But that combination of, of equanimity and love really is the essence, I think, of practice. Okay. So let's see here. Anybody else? Specific question or situation? I see wonderful comments coming in. Um, great. Aha, great. So someone else asked me a question. It probably speaks for other people, me included. This person writes, survivor guilt. Living alone in a four-bedroom house, fostering puppies and playing with them. How to move past guilt to gratitude. Yeah. Um, this is a very complex question. I think that the first step is the step that this person has taken, which is to recognize the issue in the first place. And to realize first that the good fortune, let's say, and the virtuous effort that have together brought you some good things, it is okay to enjoy them while knowing that so many people are suffering. Uh, enjoying them less does not make those other people suffer less. And we can recognize that there are many, many distinct lives. We, you know, can recognize that um, it is both true that many people are facing injustice and are suffering a lot, while over here, we have our own life. And it is okay to be loyal to yourself, not leaving others out, not being against others, but being for yourself. The, then there's the question of the exact balance. Do you spend $100 on a nice meal, a nice sweater, or do you send that $100 to um, Amnesty International, or do you give it? to some homeless people who live nearby you. What do you do? I wrestle with that morally a lot, and it's an appropriate question to wrestle with. Then there is the question third of, I'll call it advantage. In other words, we have what we have based on three factors broadly. Virtuous effort, luck, good and bad, including the genetic lottery, and advantage. If, like me, you have been advantaged, in my case, by being white and male in America and receiving advantages that have been passed down through many generations of my white uh, American uh, parents and grandparents and other ancestors, um, not always American, sometimes coming in from other countries, those advantages, if you are advantaged in some way, structurally, systematically, that advantage is based on disadvantaging others. So then we take a look at whatever it is you have, four bedrooms, you know, that house, my house, you know, the money in your savings account. I look at it that and I know that it is the result of three things, virtuous effort, luck, and advantage achieved through disadvantaging other people. And it means that some significant fraction of whatever I have is the result comes from disadvantaging other people unfairly. That percentage, that fraction of whatever I have is not 100%, but it is not 0% either. And I think what I am saying applies to anyone who has been or is structurally systemically advantaged in whatever society or community or situation they're in. And um, so I have to look at what am I going to do with that fraction of what I have that is, in a phrase, ill-gotten gains. And I think we have a special duty with regard to whatever we judge is our own ill-gotten gains, if this does apply to you, and it may not apply to you. 
But we have a special duty, I think, morally, to look really hard at what we are going to do with our ill-gotten gains for the sake of those who have been disadvantaged so we can get it. So that's a piece of this consideration. Okay, so I see a hand raised. I see Lillian. I'm surprised so few people have raised their hand. It's okay, and we don't have to talk about Ukraine. We could talk about the person living next door to you who's a real, <laughs> who's a real troublemaker. <laughs> okay, so Lillian. And as I say Lillian to everybody, you probably have heard me say it, try to be short and try to say something that's uh, relevant to what we've been talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rick, I think your talk today really moved me and um, I just, just really wanted to ask, um, when you said take heart, right? Like when the stranger takes heart and you just go on and impact other people in the world, it's how I see you. You know, there's 453 people on this call. We don't necessarily know everybody. And yeah. you're impacting people, strangers, essentially. Um, and I am just curious, Rick. Like, I just want to take inspiration from this. And I love how you sit at the end with ill-gotten gains. And the way that you've built your business and the way you build your life, it's it's through means, good mean, good meaning, you know? Mm, thank you. And I... I guess that's my path too. Like I, you know, you can you can earn money in so many different ways, right? But you chose this. And I want to choose that. I just want to take inspiration from that, you know? And I just want to know, why do you do this? Oh, that's very touching. <clears throat> Pardon me. That is very touching, Lillian. And I feel that the fact that you can appreciate this touches the hearts of all of us here, right? And I, I hear your question and I want to respond to it. For me, and I think for really many people, I take inspiration from, from many people uh, who have... I think in this life, we come to a fork in the road a hundred times a day, right? There's a fork in the road. We come to a choice a hundred times a day. Do I lash out or do I slow down? Do I harm my body by doing something or do I eat something better? Do I indulge mean, ugly, thoughts about someone, or do I let that go by without getting all into it? A hundred times a day, we have those little choices. In our work, we have little choices. You know, sometimes people write me things and, you know, I, I might type a sentence, but then whoop, do we get rid of the sentence before we push send? We make choices. And I think the gradual accumulation of those choices determine the road that we take in this life do, and whether we take a higher road or a lower road. And um, some of those choices are really big, low road or high road. Most of them though are really pretty small. They gradually add up, which for me is really hopeful because it means that in the road ahead, it's mostly all about little good steps, little good steps one after the other. We can really take that in the way we treat other people, in the way we treat ourselves, in the ways in which we are practical and also have right livelihood. You know, we can make those choices. That's really hopeful. And it's really hopeful also that no matter what has happened in the past, right now, every minute, the most important minute of your life is the next one, minute after minute, right? No matter what has happened, whew, we can walk a higher road. That's, that's really important. And maybe I'll just add one little thing, especially as I see 
my friend Brenda here, who I'm going to get to next. Um, we can look for people to learn from. You know, who do you learn from? The Buddha really emphasized that. He kept, you know, he talked a lot about good company, being in the company of others who have bring you wisdom, bring you support, are walking a higher road themselves. They help you walk a higher road. They don't have to be perfect. You know, maybe they have some bad habits here and there. I still have some bad habits, I'm sure. But, you know, you look for people to learn from to be lifted by. And that's very important, to open to a stream of teaching, including the highest teachings of all. Those would be my two suggestions. Thank you, Rick. Well, thank you, Lillian. Always a pleasure. And always, always thank a... you for letting me learn from you. Oh, well, yeah, I know. I guess you're a therapist. You know, you're already doing doing good work. It's yeah. it's just a I'm not a therapist actually this um this is just a play on the word therapist. Oh, oh 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 I got it I got it okay I'll yeah, take that away then okay well thank you Lillian or right, you take good care all right great so my friend Brenda I'm asking you to unmute hi okay. and I am just as usual Dr Rick there is something uh, that and I'm sure that everybody who's on this in this sangha feels the same. There is something so special and radiant about what you offer to us mm. that, you know, we keep coming back for it. Mm. And uh, you keep helping us to strengthen uh, as, you know, in Qigong, you continue to do the Qi to bring more of it into you. And it's so, it's such a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting and what I wanted to say, and which I think other people experience is that you, I don't have it all the time. <laughs> you know, you can't have it like the uh, woman who spoke last week who had certain, uh, had, had reached a certain level for a few hours or something. But the right. sense that, yeah, and this sense that, uh, I hate to say it this way, but I almost feel dependent upon hearing you or being in your presence. And, and I know that's okay, you know, I really feel that's okay. Uh, you, you, but you bring this certain kind of radiant energy mm. that really is bringing out the best in many of us, I feel. And uh, my husband, you know, is now accustomed to me. Okay, Wednesday night, 9 p.m. EST. You know, I know I won't see you until we go to bed very yeah. late. <laughs> but well, thank I you. Just, really. Thank you so, so much. It's been a very different kind of meditative experience for me. And I think for many people who are here, I can't thank you enough. Oh, that's very touching. I. <laughs> so, A, I really, you know, take in the good in little Ricky, who's deep down inside and is a, a little hungry because he did not get much of this when he was little, you know, take in the good there. While, you know, I, I have seen so many pitfalls, like so many of you, of teachers of one kind or another who developed a big ego. And I do not want to do that at all. You know, that causes a lot of harm and it destroys often the goodness in what they're teaching. And, uh, you know, one thing I've kind of learned along the way, I, you know, and, and you know this too, Brenda, it's to um, be appreciative and, and to support yourself as a person without getting caught up in being a self. And part of what guides me, <laughs> as soon as I start getting into the self thing, you know, like, oh, I'm so great, let's say, uh, ugh, it's a contraction, it's pain. And continuing to follow, I would add this as well to, to what Lillian brought up, to follow the pleasure of an open heart. As the Buddha put it, find gladness in your goodness, to notice what feels better. It feels better to open the hand, right? It feels better to release the resentments. Right? And it feels better to see you every week. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes me feel good to see you. So there. Okay. 
interesting. You know, it, <laughs> Thank you. You, know, you think, oh, it's a kind of dependency, but then it's no, we aren't the self that we are. And indeed, you know, no woman is an island. Yeah. And so anyway, just to say, yeah. you know, so thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too. Okay. So Howie, I don't see your camera, but you're there. Great. And then I'll get to Leslie and hopefully Mickey, and then we'll finish. So Howie, excellent. All right. Howie. How, oh, I've, I have, I think I've asked you to unmute. You have yes, to unmute. Yes, I tried. You Hi, can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Hello. I, I just knew you were going to choose me. You know that there's something, choose me, choose me. Um, <laughs> It's probably, I, I have my back, I threw out my back, which is causing me to be cranky um, and to feel sorry for myself. Uh, I'm a teacher also and had a wonderful class yesterday with my back thrown out. Somehow they were wonderful to me. Let me lean on my Zoom, on my table as I taught yeah. a grad class. And I'm, I'm, it's so beautiful and gratifying, that class. But inside, I feel, even when I'm taking care of myself, I haven't spoken to you in a, in a year. I was being harassed by a neighbor a year ago so badly oh. that I left the place that I owned a condo to move. Yes. And I've moved into another place, which where I'm, it's a beautiful kind of environment overall, mm -hmm. but my neighbors again are terrible jerks. Mm. And I'm wondering at this point in my life where I'm starting to feel a little old, I don't think I can take it. Like what's mm. following me? What, what am I doing that I'm yeah. bringing this energy and I know I'm doing nothing, but I can't help step back to say, there's a reason. And yet mm. I don't know how to deal with this kind of conflict. In the last case, it wasn't, it was someone who was unbalanced. There was just nothing yeah. to deal with. In this case, it's people who aren't unbalanced, but are jerks. Yeah. And I just feel so discouraged and I, I'm just trying to find a way forward. You're saying all the right things, but I have to hear it again and again. Yeah. Well, I got you there. Uh, thank you. So thank you for sharing that, Howie. I appreciate it. I have two um, thoughts that might be of some help. I don't know when I'm in a similar situation. So I'm going to tell you a quick little story here. Bear with me. Uh, so my father grew up on a ranch in America. He was a cowboy. Uh, and then the Great Depression happened. World War II followed. And he left the ranch, which is still in the family, and became a zoologist and a scientist, a professor. So one summer, I worked for him. I was 19 years old, and I worked for him. And he was doing research on things that affected population changes in animals. And he, his specific research was on what are called meal worms. These are little worms that will sneak into bags of flour and other sorts of things and lay eggs and have babies and then become they become worms, larvae, and then the worms become little things that fly around. Okay, so my father did various things to study the population growth, including giving some groups a lot of food compared to other tubs. We had these tubs that were about two feet by three feet large. Other tubs were got very little food, and some tubs he put in a refrigerator. They had to deal with the cold. Other tubs he left alone, so we studied the, the rise and the fall. And the way I would count the so every day I counted the number of live mealworms in these different tubs, and I did it based on a grid that was like an inch square laid over the top of the tub so I could count them carefully. All right. Well, over time, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, I noticed that sometimes there are clusters of uh, mealworms in one particular area, like you, Howie, a cluster of a bad event. And I said to my dad, Dad, this is not random. Why are there clusters? He said, no, Rick. If they were exactly spread out, that would not be random. Randomly, clusters form in nature whether it's clusters of cars on the freeway or sometimes clusters of bad events in our life. And it's very powerful to appreciate that many, many things happen that um, are just luck, good luck or bad luck, clusters of good events, clusters of bad events that we don't have to take personally. 
So that's one thought. The other thought is just to find the equanimity that can look at other people with good wishes to help yourself stay happy, if for no other reason. Hopefully other reasons too that are moral, but if no other reason than your own self-interest, to look at other people with basic goodwill, even if you don't want to talk to them or have anything to do with them, you're, you're not hating them, you're not trying to hurt them, um, while at the same time recognizing their mind stream is their own. You are not implicated in their mind stream. This is very useful in many situations, right? They're, the causes and conditions that have created that stream of consciousness over there, it's different from the causes and conditions that have created your stream of consciousness over here. We are both radically interconnected and we are radically independent. We are radically, or more exactly said, we are radically distinct, right? Each leaf on a tree is radically distinct from every other leaf on the tree while being radically interdependent. And that recognition can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. I thank you. That's, yeah. that's really, I'll just add one quick thing. My brother. Uh, really quick, because I want to keep going. No, no, here. go on to somebody else. I appreciate so much what you said. Thank you. Oh, okay. Me. Sorry. Sorry. It's <laughs> okay. Till the okay. next time. Okay. I'm good. a teacher. You. I want to talk. You no, get no, it. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Leslie, I'm asking you to unmute. There you go. Very good. Hi. Thank you so much for this evening. I've been following your teachers' teachings for years. Uh -huh. like a cool glass of water on a hot summer day. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, so what's your question? Well, my question is we're living in times of perhaps anxiety, where a lot of yeah. people have anxiety. And you mentioned pain, that um, there's a part of us that hopefully will maintain awareness of pain while still not liking it. I'd like to ask about big anxiety, not yeah. your varieties, like small, containable, but anxiety where you're actually, it's so strong that you become fearful of the fear and you have amygdala hijack. What? <laughs> You know, like and I got it. Yeah. Feeling helpless and powerless. Yeah. How moment do you cultivate? Right. Kindness well, when really, yes. So, truly, I, I can feel that you are talking about yourself, right? As well as other people. And right off the top, you know, I feel for you. Uh, and that. Uh, response is a normal one. It's not special to me. I'm sure there are many people here who are imagining empathically what you're talking about and have, you know, heart for you. So it's, it's you know, I'll just say that for a second. Uh, several things. First, there are very good treatments for panic. If we're talking about panic attacks or the fear of panic attacks, you may have explored those. They're not perfect but a lot of good practical science has been developed about helping people with intense anxiety, including all the way to a panic attack. So, you know, make sure that box is checked. Just, I'll mention it. Next, it's very good, you can imagine I would be saying this, to build up strengths inside next to the anxiety. Here's the anxiety. What is around it? What is next to it? That's very important. Maybe the anxiety will not change for a while, but what is around it can be grown and developed. And that is often a very good place to start, not addressing the anxiety directly in the beginning, but building up resources around it, like being able to calm your body, to relax, like being able to have a feeling to, to recognize that in the present, you are all right right now, basically. Another major resource around anxiety that is well-researched is feeling connected to other people in good ways. You care about others, some others care about you, and to feel that. That's a very important resource for anxiety. 
Another one is to build up um, a rational view that does not overestimate threats and does not underestimate resources, a rational view, including through methods of cognitive therapy that people can do on their own. Okay, so th that's a quick list of some strengths, some flowers, as it were, you can grow around the weed, quote unquote, of anxiety. And you can see things that I've written about that in some depth in the book, Hardwiring Happiness, Resources for Safety. You can do that. Then I'll say two things and then move on to Mickey. Um, it is possible over time to actually pull the weeds of chronic big anxiety through releasing it, through using the method that I summarize as the link step in my heel structure, have, enrich, absorb, link, which I did not invent. Basically, it means being aware of both positive and negative at the same time with the positive matched to the negative and gradually soothing it, easing it, and replacing it, and even preventing the reconsolidation of the negative back into the brain. Those are really good methods. Uh, the other thing is to um, draw on the Buddhist teachings to recognize the emptiness of anxiety. This is kind of a sophisticated method, but I believe you could do it. Essentially, we look closely at the experience of anxiety directly, and we start to uh, deconstruct it. We start to pull apart the different threads that make up the knot of anxiety. What are the body sensations in different places in the body? Which ones are intense? Which ones are less intense? Which ones are um, in the legs? Which ones are in the belly? Which ones are in the chest? Which ones are in the throat? We start to realize that what we call anxiety is made up of a dozen things that are all distinct and changing. And when we start to look closely, whether it is the pain in our knee as we sit in meditation, or a feeling of depression or anxiety, we can, through insight, vipassana, we can recognize that it is insubstantial. It exists, it is there, but it exists like a cloud, not a brick. Not a brick, but a cloud. Wow, that is really powerful right there. Um, and then last, we can take our seat. We can find refuge in the underlying awareness that is not anxious itself. We can take refuge in the underlying lovingness that is not anxious itself. You know, we can take refuge in our underlying sense of strength capability, determination that is not anxious itself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And the other thing about anxiety, like you said, to be, we're anxious about anxiety coming. It may come, it may go. To regard it a little more like the weather, like you probably don't want a bad rainstorm, you know, I, although in California we want rainstorms generally, but anyway, you don't like the weather, right? It's okay, but it's going to come, it's going to go. It's not you, right? You have anxiety, which is really different from being anxiety. Yeah. Okay. I hope that helps. And I'm sorry, I've got to keep going. Uh, Catherine, I'm just not going to be able to get to you this time. And I, I should have told you all, we're going to have a guest teacher next week and the week after, because I'm going rock climbing on Saturday for a week in Joshua Tree Park or scrambling because I have to protect my shoulders and da, da, da. Anyway, so, okay, Mickey. Mickey, I'm asking you to unmute. There you go. You might want to turn on your camera. You did. Great. And I'll be really quick. And those who want can leave, certainly. It's okay. You talk about genetics and luck. 
And I've been pretty fortunate and accumulated uh, a lot of knowledge and some yeah. money. Now I'm retired for a while and I'm fi- trying to find ways to, to redistribute this knowledge, this traditional knowledge that I accumulated and some of the wealth that I accumulated. Yeah. And you talk about heart. Well, I've got heart. I just, where do I distribute these things? Or how do I redistribute oh. these things? I've tried, uh, mm-hmm. but they're not people who are willing to learn the new old traditional stuff, you know? So what I'm afraid of is I'm going to take it to the grave. Yeah. Well, so thank you for sharing that. And in a way, to me, you talk about a kind, you're talking here, you're giving an example of a kind of struggle and suffering that many people have in which they're, they are looking for others to receive their genuine gifts, including love. One of the great sorrows is to not have beings to give our love to. And um, and to not have outlets for the flow of contribution that we want to make. And that that's a challenge. It's a challenge. Uh, I don't have any specific practical suggestions. Well, you mentioned that you had the uh, issue. In terms of what to do with, with money, yeah. Issue, yeah, with, with assets, uh, mm-hmm. knowledge. Yeah. Well, your, your knowledge, you're spreading very well in this Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, what, maybe that's a way to think. Sorry to interrupt you, Mickey, just because we need to finish. Uh, have you thought about writing or teaching some of what you know and putting it on the internet? Oh, it's not a written it. I've written a book about it, but I haven't. Nobody wants to read it. Well, you could be surprised, especially if you post it in small bites because many people are interested in small bites. Uh, and you really, these days, with the whole World Wide Web, um, we can make an offering on the internet with a little blog or a little video that we put up on YouTube. Um, and you just don't know the number of people uh, who might receive that's it. That's an idea. Yeah, yeah. Put it out there. At least that's what we can do. That's all we can do. I walk through a library. I see all the books. Most of those books I will never read. Frankly, many books, including my own, many people will not read. Okay, but still, the books were worth writing. It was worth making the offering. And there are many mysteries about who we help and how we help them. We just don't know. It's not our job to make them receive our offering. It's our job to make the offering sincerely, skillfully, with courage, with effort. That's our job. And we can go to sleep thinking, yeah, I did my job today. Okay, tomorrow I, I'll get up and I better do my job again, <laughs> right? That's how we can be. And after that, it's messages in a bottle, you know, like or the parable from Jesus. We cast our bread upon the waters. And then what happens next is mostly out of our hands. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mickey. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.